Good morning, my name is Paul Burke. I, I am a fellow here at the Australian National University and it is a great honour to be chairing the economics session at this Indonesia Update 2016. We have two very distinguished speakers in this session and it's my pleasure to introduce them. The first speaker is Professor Gunther Schulze from University of Freiburg in Germany. Uh, and Gunther is also an adjunct professor here at the Australian National University. Gunther has been working on Indonesia for some time. His research is in development economics, international economics. He is currently writing the survey of recent developments for the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies, which is uh, the leading journal on Indonesia's economy and is hosted here at ANU. So Gunther will have about 40 minutes to update us on what has been happening in Indonesia's economy. It is a great privilege to have another visitor to the ANU, but also someone else who is coming back to a second or maybe third home, and that is Dr. Muhammad Khatib Basri. Dr. Basri has a CV that is almost as impressive as it is possible to have. Uh, some highlights, of course, being uh, Minister of Finance of Indonesia in the years 2013 and 14. He was also chairman of the Indonesia Investment Coordinate Coordinating Board 2012 and 2013. He is currently T. Kian Wee Distinguished Professor, Visiting Professor here at the Australian National University. And his other current positions include Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Mandiri Institute and also of the Indonesia Infrastructure Finance. On his CV, actually, though, there are perhaps two achievements which are right up there, near the top anyway, and that is two degrees from the Australian National University. A master's in economics and then also a PhD from, the econo from ANU, and he received his PhD in 2001. So could we please welcome both of our, our speakers and Gunther to, to present the update. So thank you very much. Thank you to the Indonesia Project for inviting me to give this update. Um, that's really a pleasure. Um, and thank you for being here. I just recently came back from Jakarta, and I have to say it has been uh, two of the most educational weeks I've ever have gone through. And I'm very happy to be able to share some of the insights that many, many people who I'm to whom I'm very indebted to have imparted on me. So, you know, 40 minutes, all there is to know about Indonesian economy. That's almost impossible, but uh, we thought we, and I have to say, this is joint work with Natasha Hamilton Hart out of the University of Auckland. Uh, we have um, titled our Indonesian update uh, in striving to regain competitiveness and fiscal space. So I want to take you through uh, this uh, through my talk in six steps. So the first one is the context where we start off and the challenges that Indonesian economic policy today faces. Then I want to give you a little bit of update on GDP and growth, money and banks, trade and investment, the policy packages, and then striving for fiscal space. Okay, let's go. The context, and if you want to Twitter, I know that you are all tech technologically savvy. This is what you have to Twitter, okay? <laughs> so, the context, after the commodity boom, Indonesia faces dual challenge of ensuring, ensuring stability and growth. So where did Indonesia come from? Commodity price boom was going on from 2003 to 2012. It led to, of course, rising commodity exports proceeds, but of course also rising real exchange rate, a declining share of manufacturing, Manufacturing was still growing, but the share was declining, and high growth rates. After the party that came to an end in 2012, 
We had declining growth rates, declining revenues, depreciating exchange rate, a negative current account, and a stagnating poverty rate that had been going down before. So this is our GDP growth rate in real terms. And you can see here from 2000 on, onwards, it had been going up. Then, of course, the global financial crisis. It had been at uh, levels well be above 6%. And after 2012, it came down. This little spike here tells me that is the government forecast for this year. It might just as well be flat. <laughs> um, we don't know yet. So accompanied by that is uh, a nominal ef ex effective exchange rate decline. So that's the relative price of currencies. That's the relative price of the Indonesian currency towards a basket of other currencies. The weights of these other currencies are defined by their trade share. And you can see that Indonesian rupiah has been declining a little bit uh, rebound after the global financial crisis, but it has been declining. That seems to suggest that Indonesia has become more competitive because the prices have become, the, the goods have become cheaper, the national currency has gone down, but in fact that is not the case. Because you have to, if you look at real exchange ratios, you have to take into consideration the respective inflations. If you do that, you, you end up at the concept of a real effective exchange rate, and that looks like this. And you can see that it has gone up. OK, this is the global financial crisis again. It has stayed there. And starting in 2012, it has gone up a little bit, rebounded. But if you have a line here, this goes up, and that goes a little bit downwards here. So that means if you want a loss in competitiveness of manufacturing goods if you wanted to export them. So that's the current account. Um, surplus or deficit, you can see and it's in share of GDP. You can see it has gone up and down. It has always been positive and since 2011, for the first time in many, many years, it has become negative also. To give you a sort of an idea how well Indonesia is integrated in the world economy, not commodities but manufacturing, uh, I borrowed this picture from the World Bank Indonesian Economic Quarterly and you can see here, the left-hand side is relevant for Indonesia. The right-hand side is only relevant for China, right? So you can see here the Indonesian's global manufacturing market share. So this is Indonesia. That's 0.6, and it doesn't really change. In comparison, OK, China has gone up to about 20. Uh, Malaysia is, has gone up and then is sort of stagnant, but at much higher levels, 1.5. But look at this, this is Vietnam, that goes up. Indonesia doesn't. So, we have a loss of competitiveness. We have, if you want, wrong macroeconomic prices for the after party period. We have a too high real exchange rate. Oh, tradables are growing not as strong as non-tradables. We have too little productivity. That's a graph I didn't show you. Um, Indonesia has the lowest labor costs in the area, but it has also the lowest productivity, labor productivity, that is, meaning that labor unit costs are quite high. And so that is a problem for competitiveness. It has a too poor infrastructure. I wanted to give you more data on that. Port waiting times or other indicators, but I skipped that for uh, reasons of time. So there's a lack in infrastructure quality and infrastructure quantity. It has too little trade and it has too little manufacturing. So that's the challenge that Indonesia's economic policy is up against. And I think we have a dual challenge right now. That is the stability challenge or how do we secure a stable macroeconomic environment which includes a stable fiscal situation, a sustainable fiscal situation? And second, the growth challenge. Yes, we are still at hoovering around 5%, but still how to regain competitiveness after the resource boom has come to an end and how to ensure sustained 
enhanced growth, which is not only important in itself, but given high youth unemployment rates, um, increasing inequality, that is really an important issue. Good. GDP and growth. Now you can Twitter again. <laughs> growth is at around 5% with tradables growing more slowly than non-tradables and exports and imports declining. So here you can see uh, basically one thing is that this year on year, quarter, quarter by quarter, right? So growth rates are around 5 to 5.2%. Um, and what you can see is trade, exports, and imports. Exports have been declining. Trade, imports have followed suit, so they are declining. Um, <clears throat> consumption is strong, relatively strong. But, but the external balance, um, the trade is diminishing on both ends, exports and imports. If you do this by sector, and I won't go take you through all the numbers, the only message that you should uh, get here is that these are the non-tradables, these are the tradables. If you look at the tradable growth performance, it's either negative or relatively low. Manufacturing is below the average but the non-tradables uh, are above average. So non-tradables grow faster than, than, than tradables. It seems to be still a story that the economists will call the Dutch disease phenomenon. We have something of this kind here in Indonesia also. Okay, money and banks. Monetary policy is stability oriented. Banks are relatively healthy but with too little competition and heavy, heavily regulated. Let me give you a couple of um, points here. This is the slowing down of bank lending. So these are growth rates. They are still positive, but they have been coming down quite a bit. So that's 12, 2012, end of resource boom. This is where we are now. If you look at the uh, scale, that is quite a significant decline of growth rates in credit. That's our banking uh, sector, very quickly. It is still healthy. We have high capital asset ratios. We have high profit rates overall. Yes, the non-performing loans are increasing, but they are still at a level that is, um, you know, it's around 3% that is still um, okay by international standards. So no alarm bells here. Um, this is the structure of the banking system, and it's called Puku Satu Dua Tiga Empat. This is the biggest, so these are the big, uh, big guys. That's the, the highest level. These are only four banks, three of which are state-owned banks. This is the second tier, 23 banks, and then uh, 50 in the third tier, and so on. Um, what we can see is, that, uh, and I won't take you through the numbers because that's a lot of numbers and I don't want to drown you in numbers. But what, we, what you can see is that the net interest margins are very healthy for the, f for the upper level, mm -hmm. not as large for the second level. And all the other indicators show that the second level banks are um, not as profitable, more competing, and more liquidity constrained than the four, four top ones. Um, and I was wondering why, and I asked a lot of people, and then it turned out that one of the, of the real key issues is that they are constrained in terms of liquidity and deposits, but the big ones aren't. And part of the story is that the big state-owned enterprises are, um, by custom, depositing their deposits with the state-owned banks. So they are quite liquid here. So that is a structural problem in the in the Indonesian banking system. Um, government pressure is on to lower its, uh, the interest rates. Jacobi in February said he wanted the interest rates to fall, fall, and keep falling. Well, BI rate has been stable since June at 5.25. Um, deposits rates are capped, depending on whether it's Buku Empat or Tiga around that deposit rate in a bandwidth of 100 or 75 basis points. There are minimum lending ratios. Um, there's average lending rate is at almost 12%, relatively high. 
And the monetary policy is stability, stability oriented. Um, and that has shown in an in inflation that has come down. So this is the inflation. The big one, the black line, is the headline inflation. So that's what you see in the newspapers, right? That's what reported. This one here is what uh, economists call the core inflation. So that is the part of the basket that is not as volatile. So you deduct energy and food. And therefore, it is a little uh, less volatile. You can see marked differences here. And you might wonder what that is. Here it is. These are the food price inflation. Well above the inflation rate, well above the core inflation, and going up here again. So food price is increasing in price levels much higher than, than, um, than the other basket. So I'm wondering, I was wondering whether that has anything to do with policy. And then as, as an economist, we always suspect that policy has a role to play, and it does. So that leads me to the next issue I want to take you through, and that's trade and investment. So to Twitter, trade and investment policies are still rather protectionist, which is not good for growth, not good for poverty alleviation. So why is that? Well, we have mixed signals when it comes to trade and investment regime. And Eve was earlier pointing towards that. And I can follow up on this nicely. We have a negative investment list that has been shortened. So there has been some uh, liberalization going on. And I'm going to come back to that. There is discussion still on TPP and trade talks with the EU. Might be much ado about nothing, but they're still talking. But then there is protectionist attitudes in trade in agricultural goods and elsewhere. For example, lo local content requirements for uh, cell phones have been uh, tightened also recently. So instead of giving you an overview over the entire uh, trade policy, which is basically impossible in 40 minutes, uh, I'll single out one market, and that's the market for rice, because that also has a poverty angle. Um, so this is the rice price over time. But it's the Vietnamese rice price. And it's medium quality rice. Um, and you, oh, that is bad. Sorry. Uh, that runs from, it ends in 16, and it runs from 09, January 09 to May 16. Sorry for that. So it's volatile a little bit, but it's, and this is in, converted into a rupiah per kilo, right? So that's the Vietnamese price. Now get ready for this. And that's the Indonesian price. Consistently above, and the differential is widening. You know, if you take the average over the last year, the price differential, get ready for this. The price differential has been 73%, 73, 73. So Indonesian consumers pay 73% more than Vietnamese consumers do. Why is that? Because trade is restricted. That's the classical thing for a trade economist. You see two prices, then you know if you open up trade, this price is going to go up, this price is going to go down. What does that do to Indonesia? Well. <coughs> According to the World Bank staff calculations from 2013, which I borrow, a 10 percentage point increase in rice price increases poverty rate by 0.45 percentage point, or 1.1 million people. So if you go back to that, if since uh, Vietnamese is not a large country and Indonesia is a large country, the price will be somewhere in between. So back of the envelope calculations would tell you sort of 20% might the rice price go down, more or less, right? Back of the envelope. Don't take me up on this exactly. So I didn't calculate that. But if you, if you do that, what does that mean? That means you're lifting 2 million people out of poverty. So that is not, that is not a small issue. That's a big issue. So the trade policy in Indonesia prevents people to get out of poverty. 
So what should we do? We should open up for trade, right? We should do that quickly, but we should do that in a measured way, saying we don't have to do this all over once, because we have also Indonesian farmers that might see um, that their prices will get eroded. Um, but then, of course, if we have a productivity issue, because that's what, what this graph that I showed you basically says is we have a productivity issue. In Vietnamese rice farmers are more productive than Indonesian ones. They can offer it at cheaper prices. Then we have to tackle that issue and not restrict trade, meaning we have to look at supply side. Maybe we have to provide irrigation. Maybe we, the logistics is not right. Maybe there is some uh, market imperfections in the, in the, um, in, in the value-added chain between the original producer and the final consumer. So we have to address these issues rather than trying to protect the farmers through trade protection and making consumers suffer. Um, we will have to change Raskin policies. Um, I, I would think one should you know, um, change it into monetary transfers, and we would have to change the function of Bullock quite a bit. I'm very happy to talk about this, but for reasons of time, I skip it over because I want to give you some core messages rather than going into details. Okay, uh, trade policy in general. We know from trade theory and empirical analyses that import protection lowers exports. That's the so-called learner symmetry, and every, all students of international trade are pestered with this, so you know this. Trading firms are more innovative. Likewise, firms that are exposed to FDI are more innovative. And innovation drives economic growth more than any other factor. We know open societies grow faster on balance. There's a lot of empirical evidence on that. And for Indonesia in particular, there is uh, evidence by uh, uh, Robert Sparrow from formerly ANU and Christina Kishkatus, formerly University of Freiburg now University of Göttingen, they show that trade liberalization in Indonesia, that is the tariffs have come down, have reduced child labor, have reduced poverty, have increased employment. So a liberal trade and investment policy stance will enhance productivity, growth, employment, and reduce poverty. It's a good thing to do. Fifth, reform packages. Reform packages go in the right direction, yet they are too many, they came too fast, and there is no overall concept. Um, Eve has called this pr development pragmatism. That is a very nice term that she coined. Uh, it, it is reflected here also. So this is one. This is package one to five. This is package um, six to 12. And we even haven't looked at uh, package 13. It should be in the bottom, but it's not. Um, it's too much to take you through. I can't possibly discuss these things. We have views on those. But I'll pick out two, the ones that are highlighted in, in uh, red, so the minimum wage and the deregulation of foreign investment. So let's talk about those. Minimum wage. Previously, the idea was it was set by the province, and then the Kabupaten and Kota could top it up. So the province was a lower bound. And there were three party negotiations between employers, employee organizations, and the government, and then the government would set it. That was due to a political process, and the political process looked differently in every district. So the outcomes were very different, and they were up to negotiation. That created great uncertainty because that was negotiated every year. It created unfairness because in some districts it was excessively high and others it was low, depending on the political game that were played here and there. And um, the minimum wage, even though the formal sector is not um, overwhelmingly large, but it affected the whole wage setting. So this uncertainty and unpredictability, of course, is bad for businesses, is bad for growth, and so that there was a need for action. So the government took action, and that in itself is a good idea. Um, but let's, let's have a look at how the formula 
and they introduced the formula, how the formula looks like. Economists love formulas. That's the only one you're going to get. I'll explain it to you. This is W for wage, and this means minimum, this lower bar, right? That's district I at time T. So this minimum wage in district I at time T is the wage, the minimum wage that had been there in the previous period, T minus 1, multiplied by 1 plus pi plus G. Pi is the inflation rate for whatever reason. It's the inflation rate at time t. And g is the growth rate, the real growth rate, at time t. The little thing to realize is there is no i here and no i there. So these are nationwide inflation rates and nationwide uh, growth rates. So what it means is you simply multiply what was there previously by the nominal growth rate plus 1. So you inflate it up, right? Do we think that's a good idea? Well, higher predicti predictability is good. Less uncertainty is good. But then these are nationwide magnitudes, right? They do not look at the circumstances in that particular district. Now, you know there are 500 districts. You know Indonesia is vast. I don't have to tell you that. And situations are quite different. But in particular, what they don't look at they don't look at productivity. So if you have a high productivity in one district, high productivity growth, you have more to distribute. You can go up with the wage rates. But if productivity is slagging and you have to raise minimum wages, then you price this district out of the market. Uh, coming from Europe, we have a lot of um, cases like that on a nation basis. Look at Greece as exactly that problem. If you do that, you are headed for trouble. It's not a good idea. OK, next point, negative investment list. So for many sectors, foreign ownership is restricted uh, up to 100%. This negative investment list has changed. 17 subsectors have been liberalized. Uh, the maximum foreign ownership has been increased in 25 subsectors to 49, I think 69 or 85 percent. Um, and there have been tighter restrictions in six subsectors. So that seems on balance it would be, you know, liberalizing 17 plus 25 against six. Well, that seems on balance to be more liberalizing. But you have to take that into perspective. 20 are fully closed. 145 subsectors require cooperation with Indonesian firms. And 350 still have ceilings on the equity shares. So if you look at the changes made here and the stock here, you come to the conclusion that yes, on, on balance, it's a liberalization, but you know, it's, it's relatively modest changes. And what really matters is there is no general change in policy attitude towards FDI. It's still very restrictive. So we think it's too little, it's too timid, and it's mixed signals. Overall assessment of policy packages without going through them. Sorry for that, but it's just 13 packages and they have sub packages between two and four. So that would make 40 packages I can't possibly go through. Overall, we think it's the right intention, the right direction overall. Uh, it's a very mixed bag, right? There are big issues and small issues and they are all called packages. It's very ambitious. It requires a lot of organizational and implementation capacity. And it's so many, right? And there are jurisdictional issues between local and central government that are unresolved also. So it's not that easy. Also, there is no coherent policy approach. There is no prior to, uh, priorities attached to the different packages. So it's sort of a a bag of all things that needed to be done somehow and someone thought about it and wrote it down. Now I'm a little bit unfair, okay, I'll, I'll have to say that. But it's sort of, it's not what an 
academically inclined professor would do. He would sit in some chair and then write up a story, but politically inclined professors can maybe tell us why that has come across. So I think a clearer focus would have been better and less could have been more. Point six, striving for fiscal space. Indonesia faces serious fiscal challenges. The tax amnesty alone will not do the trick. A comprehensive approach is necessary. So let's talk about that. So that's the budget. Um, and it's revised and it's actual from last year. And it's uh, the budgeted and the revised and what happened until July. Now let's see the first thing. Now we are looking at revenue, right? The actual one was, and that's in trillion uh, rupee, 1,500. But they have budgeted an increase in revenue to 1,800. They have revised it sort of downwards a bit, but not a whole lot. So it's a huge increase in revenues if you come to think about it. Let's look at uh, the expenditures. It was 1,800, and now we have 2,100 trillions. So that's, that's quite an increase. So they forecast an increase in expenditures and in revenues. Uh, they have revised it, but not a whole lot. But now look, look at the deficit here. So the, the revised budget deficit was 222, but they ended up last year with almost 300. Now look at the current one. We are here, the revised one is 300, but to July, we are already 250. And you know, the year is still relatively young. So that comes, brings us to the principal dilemma. So if you set expenditures and revenues come in, then not as much as you thought they would come in, then you have to adjust the deficit. Or you plan on revenues, you, you fix the deficit, then you have to adjust <coughs> expenditures. Or you could try to adjust revenues. So whatever, whichever way you go, some, at least one of the corners of the triangle has to take the hit or more. So what's the situation in Indonesia? Expenditures are increasing because of social and physical infrastructure investment. <coughs> they are in principle a good thing, right? Revenues are declining. End of oil price hike, uh, end of commodity boom, lower growth rates. And the deficit is increasing, but we have the 3% budget rule, and whatever you um, incur as a deficit will be an obligation in the future, as we know. So that is the problem. Now we had an estimated revenue shortfall of $219 trillion. And uh, the new finance minister has reacted to that and has cut government expenditures by 133 trillion. Part of it is local government, part of it is central government. Um, and they, they said they would increase the budget deficit from 2.35% to 2.5% of GDP, but the question is whether that will actually be 2.5 or rather 2.8 but they still have a little bit of uh, room until the 3% budget rule limit. And then there were various other measures to increase revenue. So the central challenges that fiscal policy in Indonesia faces is now to increase revenues, which is the tax base, tax rate, and compliance, to spend the money they have wisely, to keep the budget deficit in check, and to overhaul the system of taxation and tax administration. That re refers to tax rates, tax exemptions, tax base, and of course to the tax amnesty. So let's talk about that. Before we do this, current situation, we have 28 million individuals. We have 30,574,428 taxpayers. 
out of that, 28 million are individuals. That's 11% that's of the population. So there is room for improvement. Um, we have a filing compliance that has improved, but it's less than 60%. So if you get the compliance up, you solved a lot of problems already. Um, but of course, there are reasons why compliance is pretty low. Um, tax revenues to GDP is around 11%. If you plug this all together, revenues to GDP, uh, including non-tax revenues, is around 12%. So that brings us to Amnesty Pajak. The tax amnesty, the setup. Tax returns in Indonesia, as you probably all know, require the stating of income and of assets. And not only uh, income generating assets, but all the assets. So the tax amnesty applies to, is an offer to all people with income above uh, 54 million uh, rupiah, because the ones below that don't have to pay taxes. It is a tax on wealth as a proxy for unpaid previous income tax. And the rates depend on the time period and whether you repatriate or you don't repatriate. So these are th the three different time periods. If you declare it and repatriate the funds, or if they are domestically invested, it's 2%, later on 3%, and then later on 5% and this whole thing ends at uh, March 31st next year. If you declare it only and you s let it stay abroad, then it is 4%, 6%, or 10%. Um, if repatriated, funds must stay in Indonesia for three years and invested in a list of assets drafted by the government. Um, those that just have uh, failed to declare their assets, but the income was correctly declared, they can correct the income tax and have to pay a small fee, but um, then, they are, uh, then they are home free. And then the promise is no further taxes, no sanctions, no audits on previous taxes. So the motivation for that is, and that hasn't become clear in the, um, in the political debate as far as I read it, it's repatriation of funds that has been always an issue. It's the broadening of the tax base, which is a very important aim, but hasn't been advertised. Uh, and the increase in revenues. And the official target was $165 trillion. Okay. Performance so far, $21.3 trillion. It has doubled over yesterday. So yesterday morning it was 11, and yesterday evening it was 21. And people in the um, Ministry of, of Finance tell me, Indonesian people are like that. They file at the very last minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you have a monitor here. So, um, consequently, it's too early to tell, right? Right now we have, uh, we are reaching 13% of the target. What will be really interesting is how the, where the target is at uh, October 1st. It's very clear that this whole thing has been very suboptimally communicated, that there has been a great uncertainty attached to this whole thing. But what is more important even is, and that could have been avoided easily, right? What is even more important is tax amnesty is the precursor to a comprehensive tax reform because hey, why should people pay taxes now if they hadn't in the past? There must be something that has prevented them from paying taxes. And if you now want to lure them into the tax system, you have to change on many counts and not just offer a tax amnesty. Uh, international experience with tax amnesty has been very mixed. And what permeates out of this um, empirical evidence is that is really important. So you need a different approach in tax administration, and you need a more consistent, a simpler tax system with broader basis. If you have a simpler tax basis that has no exemptions, then there's no discretion on part of the tax officials, and so there is no entry point for you know what I mean. Good. So there are four different taxes that, that I could take you through, uh, or I can go in the Q&A, could go to these different taxes. Uh, quite interesting, learned lots. 
the, um, let me briefly talk about, let me briefly talk about the value added tax and then we skip the rest. Um, the tax rate is 10% could be raised. The threshold is pretty high. Uh, there are too many exemptions. They should go, basically, most of them. It's not clear why hotels should be exempted from VAT, not at all. Compliance rate is 57%. Uh, uh, there are lar large fraud because tax invoices are faked. And typically, the, the good thing about a VAT is that it is pretty fake safe because you control, you, you check the buyer of an input's uh, tax declaration against the seller's VAT declaration. If they don't match, you, you audit. But that isn't done in Indonesia. And that's a major problem. So tax administration is really a problem. We could go on to that, but uh, I will leave it at that for the sake of time. Uh, tax administration. There's very, very little trust. So these are opponents rather than um, partners. <coughs> tax administration is basically the opponent of the taxpayer. And that's not the approach that we should take. Uh, regulation, it's still too corrupt. Regulations are way too complex. We talked to a tax um, consultant. He said, sometimes I don't know what to say because I don't know it either. And that's his job. <laughs> so. Therefore, it's very, very clear what needs to be done in principle. You have to have a new attitude in regulatory partnership. You have to have a very simple, very clear tax code, no exemptions, so no discretion. You have to, uh, a good idea is a division in front and back office, so the people that deal with taxpayers are different than from those that actually audit. And you could do a lot of other things also, and I, I can tell you about that if you're interested. Um, you have to have an efficient risk-based auditing. Currently, VAT uh, refunds are notoriously slow because they audit every single application for refund. That's, that's bananas. You shouldn't be doing this. Um, and you have to have a bureaucratic reform. You have to have new technology. You have to, and that has a lot of dimensions I won't go uh, into now, but um, could tell you more about it. So in conclusion, the current economic policy has the right intention. We have someone who is interested in development. That's a good thing. Many reform steps are good and overdue. Yet, question is, can we implement them? Or may they be too many? So maybe it's too much, too quick. And if you promise too much, and you don't deliver on it, maybe then it's backfiring. So maybe it would have been wiser to focus on a couple <coughs> priority ones and really see them through, and then communicate them uh, wisely and clearly and with one voice, and don't create um, uncertainty about it. So there's still ample room for improvement in Indonesia's economic policy. But we have to, for a moment, take a step back and put the whole things in perspective. Indonesia is still growing at 5%. Many countries would be happy. So I want you, in order to get the perspective, answer two questions. One, what are the current growth rates of the BRICS? I have the answer also, but think about it. And second, by which of these gentlemen's governments would you like to be ruled? <laughs> And if you come to think of that, Indonesia is not doing bad at all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Gunther, for that very comprehensive economic update. And who better to, to make some comments on that than the former Minister of Finance of Indonesia, Dr. Mohamed Khatib Basri. Can we please welcome him? Thank you very much, Paul. A very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I think I would like to congratulate uh, Gunther for his excellent presentation. But let me be frank with you. I have a problem with your presentation, which costs. I agree very much with what you say. <laughs> so I don't have much room to say uh, something different. But so uh, what I'm trying to do in the next 
How much time do I have? 20 minutes? 20. And the next 20 minutes is probably to, um, to complement some of the issues that's probably missing in your presentation to put Indonesia more in the global context. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is I would like to highlight some of the issues that Gunther already mentioned, but it's important to, you know, to be highlighted. So let me start with the, I think it should, this conference is about digital technology, but I couldn't use it. Okay. Okay. So if, if for, for the audience who's not an economist, if, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, then I'm a good economist. Um, so if you look at this, 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 this chart, yeah? What I'm trying to say is, Gunther already mentioned about this 5% growth, but unfortunately, I don't know, it's fortunate or unfortunately, Indonesia is one of the least unattractive countries in the world now. So if you look at this, this, this chart, for example, uh, among the Asian countries, only Philippines and Vietnam can surpass us in terms of this economic growth. And we cannot compare ourselves with Philippines and Vietnam because the characteristic of the economy is quite different. So if we want to compare Indonesia, we should compare Indonesia with the resources countries. The 5% growth is not too bad. Australia, how much growth that you have? 2%, 2.5%. Brazil have this minus 3.8%. Nigeria, half percent. Russia is in trouble. So basically, all the resource-rich countries are in trouble. So if you look at Indonesia from this perspective, then we are not bad at all. I think this is very important yeah, to be highlighted. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not defending the, the, the government, but... I think this is very important to be highlighted that we are in a different uh, ball game now. Yeah, if, if the government keep talking about 7% economic growth, it's probably not realistic because the world is changing now. When we had this 7% economic growth, 7 to 8% economic growth, at that time the growth in China was around 10 to 11%. But now China only grew by 6 to 7%. Is, it's not easy for Indonesia to achieve 7% economic growth like what the government set in this target. So it's good to have this Indonesia in the global context because the global situation is quite different now. Um, and I tried to summarize all of this in one chart. Yeah, this is the global context. Hopefully I can speak in the human language. <laughs> Uh, there are several external factors that will affect any countries, the emerging market, the resources, the resources countries. The first one is, I might be wrong, but I'm in the position that the Fed unlikely will raise the interest rate this year. Looking at this global situation in the US, the situation in, break, uh, in, 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 break, uh, in, in Europe, and also in China. I might be wrong, we'll see on the 21st of, of, of uh, September later on. And even Janet Yellen does probably maximum about 25 basis point. So it won't affect you know, the, the, the capital uh, inflow, uh, prevent the capital inflow into emerging market. At the same time, the Japanese now introduced the negative interest rate. The European also introduced the negative interest rate. If you are a non-bank financial institution, you have to give a return to your investor. And in your country, you get this negative interest rate then you need to provide a return. Where else you want to invest? You are seeking for the higher yield. And a country like Indonesia, if you invest in the government bonds, in the dollar denominated bond, it gives you about 3.6% for the 10 year tenor. If you are investing in Japan, with the negative interest rate, your yield is minus 0.2%, 1.1%. So it's no brainer, the investor will put the money into Indonesian government bond or the stock market. And that's explain why the exchange rate appreciated in the last six months. It's not because we are doing great, but because the other part of the world are doing much worse than us. That's what I call that Indonesia is the least unattractive countries in the world. But this is very interesting because this is very dangerous. It remind me with the situation back on the 2013, you know, after the QE, when the low interest rate, the capital inflow coming in into emerging market, and then there is a risk of the overvaluation of the exchange rate. Gunther mentioned in his presentation that the rupiah appreciated strongly since the year 2000 because we suffered of the Dutch disease. And also, 
the quantitative easing. So when, at that time, when Chairman Bernanke decided to end of the quantitative easing, there was an issue of what we call the taper tantrum. Yeah, in many emerging markets, including Indonesia. So what I'm afraid is, the good economic condition will only last for maybe two or another three years. Why? Because if the rupiah too strong, then you will see there is a possibility of the exchange rate appreciation. At the same time, with the slowdown of China, our export will decline. And then President Jokowi will continue to boost the infrastructure, which is 80%, 90% of this infrastructure is, will be an import content. Then you will expect in three years, the current account deficit will widen. Why? This is, this is something that we need to worry about, because on the capital account, it is financed by the portfolio. If two or three years from now, Janet Yellen decided to decide to do the normalization of monetary policy, then the 2013 story will repeat again. So that is a risk of it. That's the first one. The second one is the impact of the slowdown of China. China is one of the, is the, largest, the largest consumer for commodities and energy. So the slowdown of, economic, uh, of China will have an impact on the declining commodity prices. And 60% of Indonesian economy is energy and commodity related. So this will have an impact, the negative wealth effect will have an impact on the consumption, on the income, and also on the GDP growth. I'll, I'll show it the, the, the chart later on. But not only that, this will also, will also have an impact on the government revenue. Why? Because the composition of the government revenue is about 60% contributed by the companies on the tradable sector. And if the commodity price collapse, this will have an impact on the government revenue. Why that the, the tax is focused on the, on the tradable sector? Because it's easy to identify. So when Gunther mentioned about the serious issue of the uh, issues on the tax office, I completely agree. But the biggest problem is we don't have data. This is really the biggest issue with the tax of, at, in the US at the IRS. It probably is but one out of four of the American citizens feel that IRS can detect them. But in the case of Indonesia, since we don't have data, this is really the big issue. Yeah, so the issue of this, later on I'll talk about this, this second. So what will be the option available? I believe the central bank has more room to lower the interest rate in order to dampen the capital inflow coming in into the country. What about fiscal policy? Not much room to stimulate, probably they have to do the consolidation, or the only possible solution is will be the foreign direct investment. Because if you push the growth too much, it will have an impact on the current account deficit. Yeah, and unfortunately nowadays all the bankers they don't really understand about country that they are investing about. They're just using all the 100 countries using the benchmark. If the current account deficit go beyond 3%, they just pull out from the country. If the inflations go beyond 6%, they just pull out from the country without really knowing about the country itself. When I was at the MOF, I, I recall there was a question from the investors. They put a lot of money in Indonesia because the top down, because the growth was good at the time. But their question is, is your country is a presidential system or a kingdom? <laughs> and it is true. Because what you need to do is just to look at the, the top-down approach of this. No. Now, this is the chart. You don't need to take this. Oh, I couldn't. OK. Um, no need to, 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 to look at this chart seriously. You know. <laughs> it's just to, 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 to tell a lie in a scientific way. But my point is very simple. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, the graph doesn't appear here. There is a positive correlation between terms of trade and the GDP growth in Indonesia. So if the terms of trade improve, like high commodity prices, the GDP growth will also improve. Uh, the oil price in increase of oil price will have a positive impact on the GDP. But look at India. It is very interesting to look at India. India is on the reverse. So if people are talking about India now, it's very interesting that maybe one of the reasons why India is doing well, because the commodity price collapsed. So one day, if the oil price is going back, then probably we have to look at the case of India anymore. Um, anyway, this is the GDP growth. Look at this chart. One of the reasons why the GDP was picking up 5.2% in the second quarter was because the government spending. If you look at the investment, it's slowing down. The private consumption basically flat. But the, one of the reasons was because the government spending. Now the question is whether this is going to be sustainable or not, because we heard from Gunther that the government has to cut uh, the spending. 
So this will have an impact on the economic growth later on. Let me take you to the business tendency index and the capacity utilization. The green line is the capacity utilization, is decline. It is very interesting to respond to what Gunther said that President Jokowi and also the Vice President Yusuf Kala keep saying about the central bank has to lower interest rate, fall, 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 and keep falling. The question is whether the company will be interested to expand their production if the demand is not there. So lowering the interest rate will not induce demand significantly if the demand is not there. And that's explained why the capacity utilization declined. What will be the benefit for the company to expand the production base if the demand is not there? Yeah. So I try to do a sort of like a very simple, this grandeur causality, this look at the causality between investment and consumption. Whether if, there is a, if the consumption, increase of consumption will attract more investment, or because if there is an investment, there will be an income, then people will start to consume. And then the result is quite interesting. In the case of Indonesia, it is consumption that costs investment. So if the demand is there, then the company will start to respond by borrowing the money from the banking sector to expand their investment. But expanding investment does not mean that increase the income, then will reduce consumption. And that's explained why the undisbursed loan is rising in Indonesia. Even though the interest rate has been cut for about 100 basis point from Bank Indonesia, but if you look at the interest rate for credit, it's only cut by 40 uh, basis point, and the credit growth steadily declined. And the reason behind that is, in the short term, the issue is more on the demand side. So we are back in the very classic preposition of Keynesian during the recession. The, the, the monetary policy will not work within the short period of time. And that is quite familiar what happened in Japan, what happened in the US now. So, so even the, the president saying that we have to, um, uh, we have to um, uh, lower the interest rate, but probably the impact will be relatively less. So what will be the solution of this? Probably the government can do the cash transfer again to induce the demand in the short period of time. Do the cash for work. The current program is under the so-called the village fund, but nobody in the rural area understand how to manage the government money. They are afraid to be end up in jail because they don't know how to administrate this money. In the past, we do have the program, the so-called the PNPM, the People's Empowerment Project, but the, the program is no longer there. So there is no way that, that the government can give this money to the rural area in a good governance system unless they introduce back the PNPM again. Now this is the growth outlook. The export is will remain sluggish due to the problem in external. Investment will pick up, but it takes time until the demand is fully recovered. Private consumption is bottoming out, but it's like L or like Nike. Just do it like Nike. <laughs> the government consumption, not much room for the fiscal expansion due to the shortfall of tax revenue. And there is a risk of the fiscal revenue next year will decline. Why? Because this tax amnesty is only once off because they put a fee on net worth instead of income. So probably the 165 trillion, if this could be successful, will increase the government revenue, but only once off, because the government can only tax the income uh, generating for that tax. So if that, and this happened back on 2009, when we introduced the sunset policy. 2009, the tax revenue increased. 2000, sorry, 2009, the tax revenue increased. 2010, the tax revenue collapsed after the sunset policy. If that's the case, there's not much room for the fiscal expansion. But in fact, the key problem is on the demand side, not on the sort of like lowering the interest rate. If that's the case, then probably the 5 to 5% 5 economic growth will stay with us for another couple of years, which is not too bad. Yeah. So it's the, the best way to do it is just to tone down the expectation. A shortfall on the government revenue, this is a fiscal issue. One thing that I would like to highlight, I think um, Gunther already mentioned about it. The problem is with the tax amnesty is because we don't know the data. The government claim they do have the data, 11,000 trillion or something. My question is very simple. If you do have a data by name, by, by account, why don't you ask them to pay the tax? Every, if they, they don't want to pay the tax, just put them in prison. <laughs> the fact that you give a tax amnesty is, be, the logic behind it is you incentivize people 
to declare their asset because you don't have the data. Because if you have the data, there is no way. If you have the data, you just call them. Everyone, when they get caught by the tax office, you know, they're shaky. <laughs> because you have to pay. Right? So there is a problem of logic behind it. This. Um, so the option is more on the spending cut if we fail to uh, get this uh, 16.5 billion Australian dollar, or we have to go with the so-called the emergency law, the so-called PERPU, because the budget deficit may go beyond 3%. But the big question about it is you can only introduce PERPU when there is a vacuum of legal basis or in the state emergency situation, a force mayor. The problem is Indonesia is not in crisis. 5% economic growth is good compared to many countries. Nobody can, can, can tell us that we are in a crisis now. So how can you introduce the PERPU? The reason to have a PERPU because the government mismanaged the budget. So you cannot justify the government policy only by changing the law. So there will be a big problem related to the purple later on. Uh, you know, but I believe that the current Minister of Finance is fully aware about it. So probably one of the best options is probably on the spending cut. Last but not least, let me talk about the fuel subsidies. Because everyone talked that we've been able to remove the fuel subsidies. Look at this. The government did a bold reform in the, uh, removing fuel subsidies. Probably one of the good things that government should do is excise on the fuel. But what about of the oil price rise? I'm using this formula. This is a very simple one, that the domestic gasoline price will be equal to the world price multiplied by exchange rate. So the price of gasoline unleaded in Australia is 1.1 Australian dollar now, with tax probably about 0.8 cents, uh, about 80 cents, yeah, if you remove the, the excise tax and GST. And you multiply by the exchange rate 10,000, so probably in the case of Indonesia, it might be around 8,000 something, which is more or less about the same. So the implication of it is if the rupiah depreciated, then the domestic gasoline price should increase, right? Or the world international price declined, then the domestic gasoline price declined. But look at on the chart, on the, 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 the graph on the, um, on the right hand side, the headline from the newspaper. It's very interesting that Pertamina suffered loss. What does it mean? It means the subsidy back in 2015. And then the one who bear the burden was Pertamina. And government to cover Pertamina losses from fuel sales. Why the Pertamina suffers? Because Pertamina has to sell the gasoline price below the market price. So it means the subsidy is back, yeah? not through the government budget, but through Pertamina. But Pertamina is 100% owned by the government. <laughs> so basically, so the, the, the real political economic question is, what about if the oil price back? Unfortunately, I don't think this will happen. Yeah? So this is real, the, the, the real question to judge whether the government will commit it with the reform on the subsidy or not. Yeah? Um, I think the one thing that I just want to comment on the reform, I agree very much with what you say, uh, Gunther. Um, but one thing that I have to, I, I have to say that probably uh, best practice will help us only for the long term because we cannot change the institutional setup and also the political setup within a short period of time. The problem with the economy is we always focus on the solutions. We probably need to focus on problems and being flexible on solutions because we have to adjust at the given institutional and political constraint. I don't want to talk about it because this is going to be my own lecture next week. Yeah, so um, the most important one you mentioned about the list of the reform, I think the policymakers know what to do, but they don't know how to do it. I stop it here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Basri. Let's go to questions, and we will take them in groups of three. If you are watching the live stream, please feel free to submit your question uh, via Facebook or Twitter, and the Twitter hashtag is IndoUpdate16. If you are here and too shy to ask a question, you are also welcome to lodge it via Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and Lydia will help us out by reading out the questions, and Lydia is not shy. 
Um, let's go to uh, Chris Manning. Please just grab my attention. Yes. Chris. I just wanted to, uh, uh, I'm former ANU, <laughs> uh, Indonesia Project. Uh, I wanted to link the, the discussion in the politics uh, to the discussion in the economics. And the discussion in the politics told us that we have a pragmatic president whose eye is on the 20, on, on 90, sorry, 2019. Um, uh, the economics tells us that we have a government that really does need to reform, and particularly uh, in regard to trade and investment. Uh, the politics tells us that that's a difficult task. Uh, look at rice, look at uh, foreign investment and nationalism. Uh, Dede's told us that the economics tells us that uh, the, government, the growth will continue at a low, reasonably low rate. So I'm wondering, with this pragmatic president, would he really think about rocking the boat in terms of trade, in terms of investment? Is there much incentive for reform, economic reform? That's my question. Thank you, Chris. Please. Uh, Ralph Milberger from the latest tricks. The latest estimates put smartphone use at about 43% of adult population, which is about 75% uh, of the total population, so about 82 million people. This has been a quite recent and very steep growth of that digital uptake, and, and it kind of surpasses the, the normal internet um, increase uh, uptake. How is that increased access to communication and data expected to affect the economic position, not just in terms of e-commerce or new digital products, but also in terms of the digital trade within the context of the traditionally analyzed businesses? I also tweeted that question, so hopefully you won't get it twice. <laughs> Okay, actually, let's take those two and please, Gunter. Well, well, or, well the, the, president's like. the president's question, I okay. refer to you. The other one, digital trade, well, in principle, it should increase competition, right? It should increase information. And by increasing information, also in remote places, it should um, deliver efficiency gains. I mean, farmers having access to mobile phones, comparing prices in different markets, being able to arbitrage, that opens up new opportunities and new information, and so therefore I think that's a good thing. Um, okay, oh. Um, on, on your question, Chris, I always believe that every president after six months will become a normal president. <laughs> yeah, so it means that whatever you promise during your campaign, the economic reality will push you into, you know, bring you into, into, uh, into reality. If Jokowi wants to be reelected in 2019, he has to provide jobs in order to reduce poverty. And if he wants to provide jobs, he need to economic growth to grow by more than five and a half percent or six percent, with his investment over GDP probably around 35, 36. Our domestic savings now is only about 33. Yeah, so there is always a risk of the expose, exposure of the current account deficit three to four percent if you want to grow by more than six uh, percent. So on this particular issue, no option left for President Jokowi unless being friendly to the market. It means that he needs to open up the uh, trade and investment regime, but of course the process is always uh, zigzag. The tug of war will continue. So you can see in the first nine months of his administration, uh, the impression we heard from the uh, session on the political update was protectionist, you know, imposing a lot of constraints. But all of a sudden, President Jokowi announced his intention uh, to join the TPP. And then he launched the economic deregulations. He shortened the negative list of investment. And even his speech in San Francisco was quite amazing. He said that we have to follow what Ronald Reagan did in the US. Nobody, there is no single pres Indonesian president there to say that because it's complete neoliberal. OK. Let's go to some more questions. We'll start with a, an internet question, but can I, uh, yes, please, and maybe one more 
right at the back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe. Please go first. Hi, Sadi Bimantara, Indonesian Embassy. Just would like to pose this question to you too, Pak Gunter and Pak Khatib. Your thoughts on the uh, advantages or disadvantages of possible separation of the functions of the Ministry of Finance. Currently, they uh, do finance, treasury, and taxation in one ministry. Would like to uh, hear your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can we go to the back? Uh, yeah, I'm James Prest from uh, ANU Energy Change Institute. Um, to Dr. Basri, a question about the uh, fossil fuel uh, subsidies. Um, just wanted to get a clarification if um, you know there's an intention to, or, or your, your view on completely removing those subsidies. Um, secondly, also a subsidy that we didn't mention is the electricity price subsidy and the uh, financial position of uh, PLN. Uh, so I wonder if you could get your comments on that. And also just on the um, progress with the second uh, crash through um, building of the electricity uh, generation capacity, the 35,000 megawatts. Thank you. Thank you, James. And Lydia. This question comes from Jakarta, from Kiki Ferrico of uh, Universitas Indonesia. Um, he asked about one on the um, exchange rate, given the fluctuations, um, what should be done to uh, develop industrial sector smoothly? And the second is on global value chains, whether Indonesia's intention to join the TPP is a correct move. Okay, excellent. Group of questions, please. I leave the difficulty, <laughs> difficult ones for him, right? So, um, uh, first the question whether there should be SARA, right? And that's not a lady, but that is the semi-autonomous revenue agency that has been proposed. Oh, I see. Um, that's Sara, yeah. Um, that's a difficult one, right? We know it is not functioning well. Um, whether creating another institution is the silver bullet, I don't know. You have, you have to have clean, efficient, and competent people who are experienced, right? The, the experienced people are in the Ministry of Finance right now. If you move them to a different institution, will they become clean overnight? Uh, I don't know. Question is then, you have to have a lot of um, delineation of authority and your, all your energy is tied up setting a new institution. It's, in my view, it's not a silver bullet. Rather, I would go through um, human resource reforms, through organizational reforms, and through auditing of the auditors, and a couple of other things that you could do, uh, and leave the institution build up for later, if at all. Um, that's the one. Um, global value chain and TPP. I'll leave the middle one to you. Um, I did have, have on my slide that we should have actually fueled fuel taxes rather than fuel subsidies, but I'll, I'll leave it to you. Um, it would be better to, in, to include Indonesia much more strongly in global value changes than they, than they are right now. Um, I think the key is here to increase competitiveness rather than to be part of a trade agreement. I'm, I'm pro-free trade, as you might have ga um, gathered. So I think, in principle, that's a good idea. It depends on, on the um, terms of the agreement, really. But I think free trade is, in principle, a good thing. So I think it would be a good idea to, for Indonesia to join TPP. But the, the key homework is to get your productivity up and running. If you think about the high-skilled manufacturing, that has been wiped out, basically, after um, the Asian financial crisis and hasn't come back again. So a lot of manufacturing still is resource-based, and this is where the government should focus on top of having a liberal trade policy regime. Okay. Um, on the, I agree on the separation of the, you call it SARA, yeah? Um, the separation of the tax office to, with the MOF, I think, uh, one of the problem with us in Indonesia is we thought we, we thought that we can solve the problem by creating institution, 
In fact, that's not true unless we really address the situation. What we need to do is probably to do reform in the tax office. You know, but without without the reform in the tax office itself, it's very difficult to expect there will be an improvement even you separate the tax office from the Ministry of Finance. In fact, we do have the so-called the transformation of 25 years of the MOF, in which there is a sort of like a plan to separate the tax office, but after we do a reform, similar to the tax amnesty. Yeah, there is a. Uh, 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 plan to do a tax amnesty after we do a reform in the tax office, not the other way around. Yeah, that's my first comment. On the issue of the fuel subsidy and the electricity subsidy, I think in terms of this electricity subsidy, the electricity subsidy is still there, but we made we, we continue to make a progress since I believe 2013 because every year we adjusted the electricity price, but it's pretty small, but it's still there. Um, um, but I think in the future, I think we need to remove this fuel subsidy, the, the electricity subsidy entirely. And I think there is a chance for them because in the case of this electricity subsidy, you, can, you have the data by name, by address. So you could do a sort of like cash transfer to uh, subsidize directly to the poor people because you do have the data. You could do a sort of like a cash transfer program yeah, uh, to... to, to to help the poor in terms of income rather than subsidize the goods. In terms of this fuel subsidy, um, well, we, 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 we are saying that this, the subsidy is no longer there, but the question is, every time the oil price uh, goes up or the exchange rate depreciates, then the government do not adjust the fuel price because the regulation says that every three months, they will refuse every month, if I'm not mistaken. So my best solution towards this is just to completely to remove this, uh, you know, price fluctuation, yeah, and put it accordingly to the market. I don't know whether this is politically feasible. The reason behind it is, if you let this gasoline price to follow the market, it won't give a opportunity for the people to adjust the price. It's like the cost menu in the case of MenQ. You know, you go to the restaurant, the price of vegetables fluctuate every day, but the menu doesn't change every day because the cost, the transaction cost to replace the menu is quite expensive, right? So, you know, even the adjustment of the gasoline price happen, that, that doesn't mean that the, the producer will adjust the, uh, the, uh, the price at any time. Um, one thing that probably I would like to make a comment on the exchange rate. In my view, I have a different view on this. Um, one of the mistakes that we made from 22 to 2012, probably 2013, is because we don't let the exchange rate to depreciate. We suffered from the Dutch disease. I got a chance to let the exchange rate to depreciate deliberately ju only during the taper tantrum, yeah, to let the exchange rate go to the market. And I think, I still believe that if we, Indonesia wants to compete to transform this from the natural resources into manufacturing, the first thing that we need to do is to ensure that the exchange rate is quite competitive. Unfortunately, this is not politically feasible because every time the rupiah depreciate will remind people with the Asian financial crisis back on 1998. So it's not easy. All right, and we have actually hit, hit our time, but hopefully the conversations can continue over lunch. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the, the Ambassador of Indonesia for joining us today, Pat Najib. Uh, it's great to have you here uh, with us. Um, and also, just before we finish, I do have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, so now is the lunch break, uh, and we would like everyone to be pleased back here at 1 p.m., and we'll hopefully be starting right on 1 p.m. for the next session. Uh, for all update speakers and chairs as well, there will be a lunch in seminar room B of this building, which is just uh, behind me here. Uh, for others, there are lots of cafes and restaurants just nearby on campus and also in New Acton. If you would like any tips on where to go for lunch, there are volunteers, very friendly volunteers around. Please do ask them. For, finally, for those who are interested in Friday prayers, then there will be a volunteer waiting at the back to take you to the ANU Indonesia Muslim Center for Friday prayers. So please remember that, volunteer at the back. Can we please thank the two speakers? Thank you.